Welcome to The Forgotten, Episode 5, A Star in Darkest Night. When we left the Kingdom of Prussia the last time, the situation was, to put it mildly, quite dire. Napoleon had crushed the army at Jena and Auerstedt, and the mass of the fortresses had fallen without firing a single shot. The mass of the territory was occupied, and the king and his wife had fled Berlin for Königsberg. To add insult to injury, on the 27th of October, Napoleon marched into Berlin triumphantly and stole the Kudriga from the only 15 years old Brandenburg Gate. He is referred to as the horse thief in Berlin to this date. Yet, as I already said, not all hope was lost. Blücher's forces around Stralsund were still in somewhat of a fighting shape, and even before he departed for Kohlberg, Gneisenau had personally supervised the training of a new army. Additionally, His Majesty, the Tsar Alexander I of Russia had intervened into the conflict by sending his sizable army under Levin August von Bennigsen to aid the Prussians in October. So there was still some fight in the kingdom of Frederick William III, although he himself did not really turn out to be a brilliant leader in war. Nonetheless, I have to come back to the Freikorps of Lieutenant Ferdinand von Schill here. His Undisciplined men were thrown out of the city multiple times by the command of Kolberg, Colonel von Lukadu, and there had been lots of squabbles between the two men. But Schild's force grew and grew with every day. The king promoted him Rittmeister, a captain of the cavalry, and the British and Swedish supplied him with both muskets and uniforms. So the ragtag bunch of volunteers became a sizable fighting force who terrorized the French very effectively. Unless the French had it with them, that is. While on the way to siege Danzig, Napoleon ordered a small contingent under General Tullier to encircle the city and stop the Freikorps from doing any more damage to supply lines. Schill attacked this force furiously, but had to retire from these attacks after suffering tangible losses. The retreating force tried to make a stand at Naugard, a little town close to Kolberg, but the detachment was completely annihilated. The French then continued to murder and rape, killing civilians in the process and further stirring up the opinion against them. So Schill returned with somewhat of a moral victory. The 5,000 French soldiers then encircled the city of Kolberg with its majestic church and sizable harbour, and furthermore, it's more than 5,500 defenders. The city, the first city with a natural harbour to ever be acquired by Prussia in his Brandenburg Pomeranian homeland, was in the southwest, guarded by the river Pesante. The harbour was guarded by its very own fort, the Fort Münde, and the overall quality of the defending forces was pretty low, because they mostly consisted out of the Freikorps and some third line battalion of the Prussian army. The fortifications were in an acceptable state, however, with the sole problem being the lack of working cannons and the low quality of these available guns. I have to debunk an old, very old myth here. The fortress commander, Colonel von Lukadu, was not at all a weak old man, a coward and completely incapable. This was rather a depiction by Joachim Nettelbeck, representative of the citizens of Kolberg and hugely important to this episode's narrative. The old noble colonel had his problems with the liberal bourgeoisie, however, and did not want them to infringe in his military planning and his job, which, given he had been a soldier for almost 51 years at the time, is a little understandable. Nettebeck himself was a very difficult subordinate, who did not consider himself a subordinate to the garrison command at all, although the laws of a besieged city certainly made him. The great mistake of Lukadu was that he wanted to concentrate the defense of Kolberg on the walls of the city and the force, not using the quite favorable terrain in front of the city, especially the Wolfsberg, which he left for the French to take and make it an artillery position. But to conclude, I deem the view on Lukadu just to be plain wrong. 
just a propaganda stunt by Nettleback to embellish his own role in the defense. But the picture of the cowardly Lukadu has found its way to history, becoming a popular accepted fact and finding its way into the NS movie Kohlberg, which I will talk about later. Additionally, he spoke with a French accent, as he was born in Geneva. He didn't understand the dialect of the citizens, called Plattdeutsch, and had suffered a stroke, which impaired his eyesight and his appearance. Not really a figure to rally behind, and his accent caused the citizens to believe that he was a spy. Poor guy. However, he was a draconian disciplinarian and not very liked in the eyes of the Freikorps officers and the Bürgerwehr, the citizen guard, which cost him his position and brings in the new commander, as I had already stated before, Major von Gneisenau. Nettelbeck personally intervened by sending a conspirative letter to the king himself, asking for a new, daring commander. As Lukadu had messed up an important offensive operation Schill undertook, and sacrificed whole parts of the city by burning them down to prevent bigger fires. This man might have been a great officer, but his PR game apparently was not too good. When Gneisenau arrived on the 29th of April 1807, the situation was acceptable. The French remained just encircling the town, not even constructing defenses, just sitting on their behinds and watching for Schill and his daring Freikorps men not to escape. The new commander of the French, a man named Loison, even lifted his encirclement for a while after the attacks of Schill. However, after the whole let's burn down our city so the enemy can't burn it down affair, the moral situation in Kohlberg was at an all-time low. But when he took charge, he did not consult anyone immediately. Before even going to introduce himself to the representatives of the citizens, he ordered an assault on the aforementioned Wolfsberg, a height 1,500 meters away from Kohlberg, dominating the fields and valleys surrounding the town. He intended to turn it into a little fortress in its own right. In this night attack, the startled French forces were completely wiped out and shattered. The Prussians managed to capture many muskets, two artillery pieces and lots and lots of tools to entrench their position with. After the battle, Gneisenau introduces himself to his soldiers, who come to adore the fiery patriot and are more than satisfied with him. On the 1st of May, he meets with Nettelbeck and the other representatives, who are as well caught by his patriotic fire, and Gneisenau explains to them that he does not intend to work against them, but with them. He puts Nettelbeck in charge of the fire guard, which becomes a very important pillar of the defense, but nonetheless he makes clear that he is the supreme authority in the besieged town. Surprisingly, Nettlebeck complies willingly. Nazanow then proceeds to flood the fields around the town, leaving the fringe only a few select passages to the Wolfsberg, which they'd have to take to get their grasp on the ultimate prize, the gates of Kohlberg. On the 7th May, the first attack by the startled Frenchmen on the half-finished defenses at the Wolfsberg failed completely. Gneisenau's study of field engineering really pays off here. Of the second attack in the night to the 18th May, the still work in progress fortification still holds out marvelously. Gneisenau writes to friend in Königsberg that, quote, the enemy had lost 13 officers and 650 men in his attack on my new defenses on the Wolfsburg. My men fought like lions. Although the enemy took the redoubt with 1,000 men against 150, we took it back after 10 minutes using only a battalion of grenadiers. But the situation gets dire. Ammunition is scarce and the fighting relies on the bayonet more and more often because the Prussians can't afford to keep firing at their enemies. But help is not so far away. On the 20th of May, two British ships carrying 10,000 muskets and several million shot for guns and firearms reach the harbor, carrying medicine, uniforms, entrenchment tools and much more as well. The defenders of Korberg rejoice, as there is now hope for the force to defend the city for a long time. Four days later, the Major reports to the King that he was lucky to tease the enemy a little. He had managed to ambush a cavalry detachment and completely destroy it, taking the eyes of the French. But the French do not like to be played with. They had procedurally reinforced their positions, especially with regiments from the Rheinkort of Federation states, Westphalians, Vertebergians, Bavarians, but of course also Italians and French forces. 
Gneisenau again writes to Königsberg that he did not enclose himself in his city, but rather advanced 2,000 paces towards the enemy. My fortress must have a grueling look for anyone approaching it. Nonetheless, I hardly ever had the time to change my clothes in four weeks. He continues with something I really can't explain to myself. He states that we have to deal with a terrible generation here. Just look around you and for every honest, strong man, you will find ten egomaniacs and one criminal. Has this ever been like this? Especially because he publishes an article in the newspapers of Königsberg stating how heroic the people of Kohlberg are in their defense and that he wishes to bear this fight with no other than them by this side. Especially Nettelbeck, a man Gneisenau personally has never come to like because of his unpolished manners and his loud and rash decision-making, as well as his lack of cultural intellect, is praised highly. I quote, He shows understanding, bravery and patriotism everywhere. He does this for free, and you can't say that Nettelbeck is rich. But who was Nettelbeck anyways? He was the son of a brewer who had learned sailing on a slave trader going from Western Europe to Africa and India and back again. He had fled from being pressed into service in the Seven Years' War and later, because of being such a great seaman, he was awarded the honorary captain title of Captain of Prussia, which he lost because he did not pay the necessary respects to a Prussian infantry officer. As you might have already noticed, Nettelbeck had his problems with authorities. After staying in his hometown Kolbeck again and becoming a brewer like his father, he started to get especially relevant to the local communal politics. After the siege, he had given interviews about it, and he was sued in more than 15 cases for insults because he was not too kind about the performance of several of the officers. This resulted in him losing his status and his fortune. He died at the ripe old age of 86 in Kohlberg in 1824. It is not known to history what had moved Gneisenau to those misanthropic remarks, but I like to think of it as the same kind of vainglory and pride he shunned after the defeats at Jena and Auerstedt. It's always a great psychological relief if you are able to say, back when I was younger, the world was a better place. But how does that fit into the image of the quite liberal Gneisenau? I do believe that he was especially tired and fed up at this point as he was in over his head with work and probably extremely exhausted. On the 11th of June, the French finally stormed the barricades at the Wolfsberg. Gneis now states that he was not able to defend it against the five to 6,000 men ready to assault after it took more than 3,000 shells and cannonballs. He seems to have nonetheless been extremely proud of the success of the redoubt. He wrote to the king, This isolated point, 2,000 paces away from the walls of the fortress, has held for 25 days against all sorts of formal attacks, taking 70, 90, 100, 120 shells a day, and it held up the accessibility by sea for this time. Now, funnily, the defenders of the redoubt were allowed to surrender and return to the fortress like the little defensive position had been a fortress itself. On the 14th of June, the fortress is again reinforced with 24 bronze cannons, 16 iron cannons and 2,000 crates of ammunition by British ships. Nonetheless, the fall of Danzig on the 11th had freed troops for the siege of Kohlberg and the Prussians certainly felt the heat. From the 15th to the 19th, the defenders, supported by the new artillery, tried several sorties to take the favorable positions and Fort Münde but have to refrain from those actions after heavy losses and little to no progress. The situation gets worse by the hour. Gneisenau puts this all on the leg of fortification and preparation in peace times. On the 1st of July, the last day of the fortress, and its great defense seemed to have come. At half past three, the French start an artillery barrage, a terrible artillery barrage from all sides. The city goes up in flames and the fire guard under Nettleback can't control them anymore. General Loison and his almost 13,000 men offer the surrender of the fortress, which Gneisenau declines. The king, my liege, has entrusted me with the command of this fortress. I promised him to hold it. I will not break this promise. My walls are intact and I will not hand over this place as long as I have any means available. 
is his short answer. So the French continue to fire for the whole day and the whole night. Nettlebeck writes about the commander that his bravery and his sobriety he showed in this terrible night everywhere were already known to anyone since the first day of his arrival. Each and every order given by him was followed with the greatest confidence in him. It seemed impossible for his orders not to turn into the will of the masses immediately. At 1500 hours the next day, the gunfire suddenly ceased. A royal decree from Tilsit arrived, where the Prussian king, together with the Tsar, had made peace on the 25th of June. The decrees were dated back to the 28th. The first decree orders that the defenders of Kohlberg lay down their arms. The second promotes Major August von Gneisenau to Oberstleutnant, Lieutenant Colonel. As a little closing, I want to quote Gneisenau's final report of the King. We have, for many reasons, not been able to achieve what we wanted to achieve. Even we have felt the shame of having cowards and looters in our ranks. But, to our great joy, we have seen the beautiful faces of courage and gallantry. Many of the courageous are lying on the fields around Kohlberg now, and their memory will give a beacon to the living. The suffering this war has caused here is great, and if your majesty's servants here have suffered so much, it would be fitting that your majesty would do something to ease their suffering. I have to commend the efforts and the zeal of the burghers of the city, which have helped me with voluntary levies of their own money. Without that, I would have not been able to defend the fortress as I did. The French had suffered 9,800 men to death, wounded desertions. The Prussians lost around 2,800. I lied a little. I do not intend to end it here. At least not without losing a few words about the NS propaganda movie Kohlberg. I did not invent the title for this episode at all. It's a popular term used in the days of the Wars of Liberation to use the siege as a dramatic beacon for the people of Prussia and Germany to rally around. But the movie itself, which can be found on YouTube with French subtitles, just search for Kohlberg, is a very interesting piece of art. Although the situation at the front was already dire when the movie was shot in 1943 and 1944, Goebbels dictated that this movie has the task of showing an example of a city that, united at home and at the front, can defeat any opponent. I allow you to ask any office of the Wehrmacht, state and party, for help if it should be needed, and to refer to my order that this movie is a weapon in our psychological war. Well, Herr Goebbels, Veit Harlan, the director, delivered. Thousands of Wehrmacht soldiers were drawn from the front, even more horses were stolen from the logistics and artillery, and especially from the agriculture department. Millions of Reichsmark were burned, and to simulate winter scenes, a hundred train wagons full of salt were used. Considering the war went badly at that point, the Wehrmacht leaders just shook their heads. Funnily enough, the especially expensive scenes of Kohlberg suffering the artillery barrage were not shown, because Goebbels did not want the German people to see the brave men and women of Kohlberg being slaughtered, probably because this paralleled the constant and terrible bombing raids on German soil. The movie makes a lot of wrong points. It portrays the end of the battle as a retreat of the French and not a shameful capitulation of the Prussian state. It makes Lukadou, as I already mentioned, a grumpy old man who has no idea about making war. There were in no way spontaneous displays of unity and marches to move the king to war in Breslau in 1813. And most of all, it was not Gneisenau personally planting the idea in the head of the king to create this people's army, probably a reference to the Volkssturm that Goebbels had personally initiated. I advise you to somehow watch this movie. It's a great look into NS propaganda, it's colorful and epic, and a despicable work of mass manipulation. It completely tanked at its premiere, being shown in Berlin, where almost nobody attended, and somehow smuggled into the besieged U-boat base of La Rochelle. When Kohlberg fell in March of 1945, Goebbels personally prohibited it from being mentioned in the radio reports of the Wehrmacht. Now I'm finished. As always, thanks for listening and feedback. And feel free to like and subscribe if you want to. I wish you a good day, or a good night. See you next time.